Hello. Hope you're all doing well. Welcome to lecture 19, where we will be talking about is Arthur Oak. What? Who the hell's Arthur Oak? Well, he's an optional reading, so you don't need to get too in, involved in who he is. Although he's a very, he was a very interesting person. Um, uh, unfortunately, he died prematurely. Um, he was only, you know, like 50. Or so. um, he was an economist, no surprise there, because after all, it's a class in economics, so usually we will talk about economists from economists' ideas. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. Maybe we should talk more about dogs. Maybe we should talk about flowers, cats. Corduroy thinks we should always be talking about him. And, um, <laughs> he has a bit of a fetish for cardboard paper tubes. Um, they are often a traditional object when he's going from one place to another. Um, and we keep a collection on a, um, a counter in the upstairs bathroom for him to go and get one. And he'll carry it around, carry it outside, and then he'll bury it. Um, we were having a conversation with one of our neighbors uh, the other night. And uh, he was digging, digging, that is, um, and burying. And we explained to the neighbor how he carries toilet paper tubes around with him as transitional objects, but he's going from one place to another and buries them. And sometimes he'll dig them up months, years later. You know, he'll suddenly go off the trail in the, in the woods across the street and he'll dig and he'll triumphantly show up with the wet, soggy, ancient toilet paper tube. Anyway, since then, this neighbor has twice put toilet paper tubes in their own mailbox for corduroy. Okay, there we go. Um, dogs, cat, uh, and is inequality good? Must we inequality to maintain efficiency? You may remember about John Rawls. Um, in his theory of justice. He believed that people would want, if you don't know where you're going to be on the income distribution, people would want an egalitarian, more or less equal distribution of income um, with one modification, that they would favor um, increases in inequality if they are associated with higher levels of income for the poor and for working people. Um, so that's Oaken's argument. Oaken was a good liberal economist, and he believed in a more or less equal distribution of income, but he thought we needed to maintain inequality to uh, tolerate inequality to maintain efficiency. Um, and this was his argument for the leaky bucket, which we'll be talking about, and which is, I believe, in the quiz or problem set or both. Okay. Oaken argues that equality generally is associated with less efficiency, because when people have pretty much guaranteed income and their high taxes on earning much more, people say the hell with it. I just won't work very hard. Now, empirically, there's actually very little support for Oaken's argument, even though it has been just about the most um, studied issue in economics over the past 40 years, um, and has had a huge, his book and his arguments have had a huge impact on social and economic policy. Indeed, whatever effect um, inequality has on stimulating work effort and invention, et cetera, um, is more than balanced 
by the negative effects on efficiency of inequality, fostering distrust, and discouraging investments in human capital. So we'll pick up on that. Okay, start with this. Should some have more than others? Yeah, maybe they deserve it. Maybe they work hard. Maybe they do unpleasant jobs. Um, firefighters earn more than most other uh, blue collar workers. Um, uh, you know, police officers earn more than most other people. Um, college professors who have extremely pleasant jobs earn more than most other people. Uh, so, yeah, but we had to work hard to get here. Doctors, college professors have years and years of schooling. I thought the schooling was pretty, pretty fun. Um, well, mostly. But anyway, so we get a compensation for that, compensating differentials. Remember back, I don't know, 10 lectures ago. On the other hand, some would say no, because most of the difference in income throughout the world comes because of which country you're born in. Born in the United States, you're going to have a higher income than if you're born in Botswana. Um, people are not rich because they work hard. They're rich because they're lucky. Um, you bought a piece of land in the right place. That's hard work, but it goes up in value and suddenly you rich. You bought stock in Xerox at the right time and then it goes up in value. It was like, huh? You know, if you were so smart, then you would have bought the stock that other people thought was of value because you would have been like everybody else. No, you did something stupid. You bought a bad stock. You bought Apple in the mid 90s when it was like barely trading above zero. You bought that stock. You know who did? Bill Gates. <laughs> he bought a big chunk of Apple when it was practically bankrupt. Um, and he got really rich. What was he doing? He was buying a stock that everybody else thought was a bad investment. And then he was lucky. Um, other times you get rich by manipulating markets. You form a monopoly like JP Morgan did in forming um, US Steel or um, International Business Machines, IBM. Um, and as far as productivity, encouraging work effort, eh, not so much. You know, on the contrary, rewards can encourage counterproductive behavior. Like what's the best way to get rich, buy a bank and loot it. <laughs> Don't rob the bank, or you could say the best way to rob a bank is to own it in the first place. But buy a bank and manipulate it. Take advantage of people. Walk away with their money. <sighs> okay. Americans generally want there to be a uh, fair degree of equality in the distribution of income. Um, you know, here is how much income we think, this is from a survey, we think um, people should have in the bottom 20%. The bottom 20% should have about 10% of total income. Um, you ask people, how much do you think they have? People think that they have like, 3%. In fact, they have barely 1%. On the other extreme, we think they should have, at the top 20%, they should have 30% of income. So then we think, Americans think there should be a three to one differential between the richest and poorest. Ask them, they'll say, well, they have 60%. Oh, this isn't income, this is wealth. They have 60% of wealth. That's what we think. In fact, the richest 20% have over 80% of wealth. Um, so the actual ratio is about 100 to 1, while we want there to be a ratio of 3 to 1. 92% um, would prefer this distribution to what we actually have. This is the distribution of wealth in the United States, 84% going to the top one. 20%. Uh, um, 
0.1% going to the bottom 20%, 0.2% going to the next 20%. So the bottom 40% of the population is 0.3% of the wealth. We wish, 92% wish that 29% of wealth would be going to the bottom 40%. Um, so that is the question. And this is the question that Oaken addressed. Um, in 1975, he gave a series of lectures at Harvard um, that were later published in a book, Efficiency versus Equality. One of, it, it would have to be on the short list for the five, certainly the 10 most important books in economics in the 20th century. Um, and it, at some point, a little back, it was one of the three most cited works in economics published in the 20th century. Um, along with Keynes and I think von Hayek's um, Road to Serfdom. And Oaken's question is if we're an egalitarian democracy, oh boy, this is another one where you can go to your parents and tell them, what did you learn in school? We learned that if we are an egalitarian democracy, why do we tolerate disparities, such great disparities in income? Um, and Oaken's answer is we accept inequality to achieve more efficiency. We are all richer because we tolerate this inequality. Um, and he says we can redistribute income. We can reduce market inequality only in a leaky bucket. We can take from the rich and give to the poor. Yeah, we can do that. But some of what we take will be lost en route. Some of what we take from the rich will be lost when we take go to the poor, because tax the rich, work effort goes down. Give to the poor, work effort goes down. If the poor could get money without working, they won't work as much. If the rich have to give up some of the money they earn, they won't work as much. And he's at least partly wrong. I mean, you know, it's logical. It makes sense. You kind of think that it should be like this, but it actually doesn't work that way. And there's another issue that's not just about economics. The degree of inequality we have now is so great that the rich dominate our politics. Now, the rich don't always all agree. Um, but where they do agree, they get their way. Whereas the average population has very little, you know, this is a study of 500 political issues since 1980 when Ronald Reagan was elected. Um, and the bottom five, the uh, bottom 80% um, of the population, their attitudes have almost, actually, I think more like 95% of the population, their attitudes have almost no effect. This is based on public opinion surveys. When average people want something, it, it's a little bit more likely to happen. But for the rich, for the top 1%, when they want something, it happens. When they don't want something, it doesn't happen. Take universal health insurance, Medicare for all. Very popular with the mass of the population, very unpopular with the richest 1% who would be paying for the program. It doesn't happen. Um, there are other issues like that. Tax increases on the rich, which happened just a teeny bit. There was a little bit of that in, um, in the Biden economic program. Um, but generally speaking, the rich don't want that, and it doesn't happen. Most people do want higher taxes on the super rich, but it doesn't matter. Okay. Okay. So our democracy is that issue. Um, for Oaken, how redistribution might lower the leaks in the bucket. Loss of work incentive, the rich don't work because of taxes, the poor stop working because they can collect welfare. Bureaucracy, unproductive government officials to collect taxes, supervise welfare. That's actually, you know, Oaken makes too big a deal of that. That's really not a big deal. Um, government bureaucracy is a very small part of government spending and the IRS and even welfare departments are pretty efficient. Um, loss of incentives to be creative, take big risks. 
related to this, but different incentives for big risks. Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, um, uh, Tesla, you know, um, people who gamble a lot. Um, uh, you know, the Alexa, um, you know, uh, personal assistant. These were big gambles that people uh, took risks on and they paid off big. Um, you know, there's a long history of favoring redistribution. Now here's Oaken. Remember production possibility frontiers? That's Oaken, equality versus efficiency. Society can be somewhere on this frontier but you can't be beyond it. You can't have more efficiency than any level of equality tolerates. You can't have more equality than any level of efficiency tolerates. Um, you could be inside, you could be inefficient. Um, you know, but that's, yeah, okay, you can get more of both, but this is all you can have. You could give up efficiency to get more equality, give up equality, get more efficiency. Yeah, so in his argument, um, uh, Ronald Reagan would have been down here favoring lots of efficiency and, get, and little equality. Bernie Sanders would be up here, lots of equality and little efficiency. Um, moderate Democrats like um, in his time, Hubert Humphrey would be over here, uh, sorry, over here. Moderate Republicans like Gerald Ford would have been here these days. Uh, Trump would be here. Biden would be here. Bernie Sanders, who's still in politics, he was he was active in the mid 1970s, um, would be up there. Um, Bernie's been at it for a long time. You know, he marched with King in the 60s. Um, he was elected mayor in Burlington, I believe, in 78. Um, he ran for governor of Vermont and got like 2% of the vote, uh, the Liberty Union candidate, um, which later became the Progressive Party, which is still active in Vermont. Um, anyway, uh, Oaken, even the poor benefit from inequality. This is, this is from Rawls. This is his um, putting into economic terms what Rawls saw as the one exception to, e to inequality, to complete equality. Greater income will be produced if you give rich more incentives. Some of us would argue that what happens when you give rich more incentives is the shit falls down to the poor. Trickle down. How much leakage would you accept? You know, if you took $100 from the richest person to give to the poor, how much loss would you be willing to accept? Bernie would probably say $95, which is about where I would put it. Um, Reagan would have said five. Trump would be zero. Um, most people might be in here. I don't know. I don't know. Think about it. You know, if you could give this poor kid in the Mississippi Delta, a hundred dollars. But uh, you know, if you took a hundred dollars from a rich person, how much would you insist this kid get? Yeah. If you're willing to give up ninety-five dollars, you'd say you'd set to get him five dollars. You'd be willing to give up a hundred dollars of economic output. Fifty dollars for the kid. Fifty dollars of economic output. You'd give up. If you're only willing to give up $5 of economic output, you're saying to get this kid $95, you'll only give up $5. Yeah. This is Oaken's question. And it's something for you guys to think about. Logic, reduce the penalty for poverty, we encourage the poor to stay poor. This became very popular in the 80s with people like Charlie Murray um, arguing that we're creating poverty by giving the poor money. Um, you know, Murray at some point said, we're buying poverty with welfare. Yeah. 
Uh, if we reduce the rewards for being rich, we reduce the incentive to work hard and productive. Read the wasteful bureaucracy. Forget that one. I mean, that's Oaken uses that, and Reagan and conservative Republicans have argued this, but that's really not a good argument because the bureaucracy is not that big. The real arguments are the first two. Um, poverty is a spur to productivity, opulence is a reward. Lazy sleep on the street. That'll teach them. That'll teach these ladies and their children to be to work hard and be productive, so they can get ice golden ice cream sundays. <laughs> this ice cream sundae from a place in New York, Serendipity or something, it's like the most expensive dessert in the world, over a thousand dollars. And you know, we set up social policy to minimize the cost of inequality. The cost of equality will give to people, but especially people who aren't going to be working anyway. So we're much more generous with children and with the elderly than with adults. Historically, we've been more generous with mothers of children than with men, adult men. And that's the logic. You know, in fact, though, Oaken's this, you know, all these studies, it's not, never works. There is no association empirically between inequality and greater efficiency. And economists have been looking for it so hard and they just don't find it. Um, this is, okay, this is from using World Bank data. data. Um, uh, here's the correlation line. What? Reduce, here's the Gini coefficient reduction due to redistributive taxes. Now, maybe if you took more at some point, you take huge amounts from the rich and give to the poor, maybe you'll get some reduction in GDP growth. But within the, anywhere in the range that we actually experience throughout the world, it just doesn't happen. The same for states. Income inequality is not associated with faster economic growth. On the contrary, you know, some of the worst performing state economies are in places like Louisiana and Mississippi. Um, cutting tax on the rich, there's no evidence across the world that cutting taxes on the rich is associated with faster economic growth. Yeah, you cut the tax on the rich, the rich get more money, and nothing much else happens. <laughs> surprise, surprise. I mean, well, okay, I shouldn't say surprise, surprise. Uh, but, you know, having looked at so many of these studies over the last 40 years, I would say surprise, surprise, because there's basically no good empirical evidence that cutting taxes on the rich will raise incomes for country as a whole. Instead, it just gives more money to the, to the rich. And yeah, since you cut social spending, generally, when you cut taxes on the rich, you're lowering income for working people and the poor, and children especially. Um, no effect on economic growth. Um, no effects on employment. It just doesn't happen. You know, yet politicians will still keep saying this, and the smarter politicians, those who actually read books, might actually even cite Oaken. Um, and certainly they'll cite people who cite Oaken. Productivity growth and the 1% share. The growth in the 1% share, the share of income going to the richest 1%, is not associated with any increase in productivity growth. On the contrary, the higher the 1% share in the United States over a 40 year period, 33 year period, slower productivity growth. The evidence is weak, but it generally points away from Oaken's argument. Now, remember, this is within the range of normal experience, you know, kind of across the countries of the world, the World Bank, the IMF, across US states. So we don't have any extremes. If you went as far as somebody like um, Bernie Sanders or I would want to go, maybe you'd get some negative effects. I don't think so. 
I think for reasons we'll go into, I think you'd have faster economic growth. This is what I've argued, been arguing, um, and it's what Bernie's been arguing. Um, but maybe because no country's gone that far. Um, but the evidence in going in the other direction, in the Reagan Trump direction, is these tax cuts on the rich and increase inequality do not lead to fast economic growth. If anything, slower growth. Um, and this is the International Monetary Fund. I mean, this is kind of amazing. You get the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund. Um, you know, and not just, you know, radical liberal economists like me. You get the most establishment economists and they're all pushing the same point. Um, change in GDP growth rate of income share changes by one percentage point. Give the rich more money, GDP slows down. You know, this is from um, uh, uh, the based on the International Monetary Fund again. Um, and here again, more inequality spells less growth worldwide. Uh, this is coming from Penn. Um, Keep in mind the US used to have much higher marginal tax rates. I mean, this goes only as far as Obama. Um, uh, Trump cut them some more. You know, but under Eisenhower, Kennedy, FDR, much higher marginal tax rates. Under Johnson, Nixon, Ford, much higher marginal tax rates on the rich. Um, you know, and there's no evidence that growth slowed. On the contrary, the lower the marginal tax rates, if anything, there's slower growth. The issue is that greater inequality brings costs. Um, now, the uh, Oaken's argument, if there's a case, it would be in this side with very, very low inequality. Maybe at that point, and this is, this is where, when he was writing in the 70s, you were getting countries like Sweden and Norway, um, even the UK, that were very little inequality, very strong welfare states. And even the United States was moving in this direction. So maybe there are problems there. Um, but since then, everybody, including Scandinavian socialists, have moved in this direction. And here, you get problems of erosion of social cohesion, social conflict um, that are probably associated with significant slowdown in economic growth. Um, now let's start with first, how do you get rich? I'm sure this is the question you're all asking yourselves. How do you get rich? Well, the best way to get rich is to be born rich. Ivanka Trump, Donald Trump, Donald Trump, by generous estimates, is poorer than he was when he inherited money from his father. Um, he's been a net loser. Um, uh, Ivanka has made a lot of money um, from having been uh, inheriting and from her position. So a third of the richest Americans were born into that super rich category. They inherited a lot of money and also they inherited positions. Jared Kushner got this cushy $2 billion deal with the Saudis. You know, he has no success as an investment manager, as a venture capitalist, no success at all. But A, you know, he's got position. Um, and very few people in the Forbes 400 were born anything but rich, you know. So they had a good leg up. Um, if they weren't born on third base, they were born on second base. Um, and so that's the first thing. So be born rich. The second thing is buy something that appreciates in value. That's how you get rich. You buy a stock and it goes up in value. I mean, you could work hard, and the hardest working people, let's say neurosurgeons or whatever, may, maybe they make $10 million a year. Um, 
business school professors um, might make $500,000 a year. Um, football coaches or basketball coaches at Division I schools, they make $10 million. That's about, the, that's about it. Working will never get you much more than that. The CEOs at health insurance companies, um, they, you know, they'll make $20 million. That's, you don't get much about that. Um, so how do you get big money? You know, I mean, really big money. You own something that appreciates in value. Now, it's not enough that it appreciates in value because what the hell if you own it and other people realize it's going to go up in value? The, sorry, if you want to buy it and other people realize it's going to go up in value, it will have already been appreciated. So you'll be buying it at a high price and, and that's what it's worth. You're not going to get rich that way. You'll get rich if you buy it when it's low. Now, why would it be low? It will be low because everybody else thinks it's a stupid idea. Like I said at the beginning, you buy Apple when it's almost bankrupt. You buy Tesla when nobody thinks that electric cars are going to, and batteries are going to amount to anything. You buy stuff that's not worth anything because everybody else thinks it's a low value. You buy a piece of real estate in a neighborhood that, oh, that's a suck of a neighborhood. Nobody wants to live there. And then, lo and behold, everybody else is wrong. So how do you get super rich? By doing the stupid thing. I mean, if it was a smart thing to do, you wouldn't be able to make money doing it. You make money by doing the stupid thing. You know, um... George Steinbrenner bought the New York Yankees in 1973, 72, 74, something like that, uh, for $9 million. It's now worth $5 billion. His son, born into that fabulous rich group, um, is a billionaire because his father did something that everybody else was thought was stupid. The Yankees were a derelict team. Major League Baseball was nah, not going anywhere. Football, basketball, that was the way of the future. People back then, people were thinking soccer was going to become really big in the United States. But no, George Steinbrenner bought a baseball team and a bad one too. And it went up and down. Now, George contributed to that. Hal has been running the team down. Um, in I mean, the Yankees suck. Why do the Yankees suck? They've got more money than God. They should be able to buy all the good players. Instead, Hal just wants to make money. And he knows he can make money without having the best team. He has to have a good team, but not the best team. Okay. Anyway, how do you get really rich? You need $2 billion to be on the Forbes 400. Um, uh, highest paid medical specialty. God, well, that averages six or sixteen thousand dollars, but some people make more. But it would take you thirty-four hundred years at that to make two billion dollars. Uh, get super rich by doing the wrong thing by being stupid. Bad luck. Yeah, I mean, look, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak bought Ronald Wayne's shares of Apple for $1,150 each in 1975. That $1,150 investment, which bought Steve Jobs one-sixth of Apple, 16% of Apple, that's worth um, about $160 billion today. <laughs> I mean... Was that a smart thing to do? Well, yeah, of course it paid off, but nobody else was even willing to spend that much. And Ronald Wayne, he wanted out. He wanted a couple thousand dollars to go to India and be a guru. Gary Kildell sold CPM, um, which became MS-DOS, you know, uh, and became fabulously rich. 
Gary Kildell lost out. Jonas Salk. Oh, yeah. He gave away the polio vaccine. God, how much do you think he could have made on that one? Frederick Banton gave away insulin. How much could he have made on that? Yeah. Oh, well. Okay. So incentives don't necessarily matter. You know, um, you got a lot of people chasing, spending a lot of time chasing the best investment. A lot of resources go into this kind of thing. Does it actually help society any? Not sure. But what we do know is that communities with wide inequality have more crime and spend a lot more on lawyers and um, burglar alarms. Inequality is expensive, produces crime and distrust. Trust is a great economic asset that allows us to work together without lots of contracts, lawyers, etc. Cooperation totally trumps conflict. Um, but inequality leads to more crime. Loss of confidence in the police, feeling unsafe. I mean, this is this is this is an economic issue. If people don't feel safe walking home alone, they're not going to go shopping at night. They're not going to work late. Plus, of course, they're unhappy. And this is a very gendered issue. Women feel much less safe than men do. If you don't appreciate that, then just give it a second thought. You shouldn't even have to ask anybody. It's obvious. Um, more people have had crime. I mean, people aren't being silly. They, more people are assaulted. More people have had property stolen. Um, it's true in the United States. Inequality raises the rewards for theft. You know, there's no, not much point bar, uh, stealing from other poor people. Or if everybody's more or less the same income, why bother? But uh, hey, that house over there, the richest people in the town of Amherst, I bet they've got a lot of stuff worth stealing. Okay. Private guards. I mean, what good does a private guard do? Well, of course, it protects your stuff, so you spend the money if you have to. But it doesn't add, these people don't add anything to our economic output. All they do is guard our stuff because the gap between rich and poor is so great that lots of people want to steal things. And lots of people, smart people, devote a lot of energy to how to steal things. It's not only the gods whose energies are wasted, um, the people, you know, you know, among the gods, I'd also add lawyers, extra accountants, people cert, you know, checking on top of each other. Um, you know, and there's the loss of economic output because people are scared. But there's also the loss of economic output because some of the smartest people in society are engaged in criminal enterprises. Um, prisons are expensive, so are lawyers. You know, criminal enterprise. I mean, Donald Trump and his children, uh, this is not a partisan statement. This is just an assessment based on behavior. They are dumb as shit. Um, and I'd count Jared and Ivanka there too. So nothing much lost by that. But Michael Cohen is a really smart guy. And he devoted his life to covering up Donald Trump's crimes. Wasted energy. A smart guy wasted. Um, and there are others in the Trump empire um, who have talent. And then, we, you know, um, and then you get to Tony Soprano. And Tony's a pretty smart guy. Doesn't do anything good for society to have people like Tony Soprano wasting their energy on crime. Um, okay. <laughs> ah, yes, there are some lawyers. Maybe they're worth it. Burglar alarms are expensive, and the people who spend their lives developing. Plus, when these things go off, oh, fuck this. That damn alarm's gone off. Fortunately, we live in a neighborhood. That doesn't happen. Um, 
Corduroy? You okay? Okay. You could always get a cat. <sighs> One of the issues for many countries like Nigeria, a country that should be really successful economically, poor governance, crime, corruption, um, people devote themselves to finding ways to get rich, great inequality. It would be nice if people there didn't need to devote so much energy to defending themselves and could put more energy into producing wealth for everybody. Health. Countries with egalitarian income distributions are healthier, which means people can work more. They don't get sick as much. Children, healthier children learn more. Healthier children become more productive. Health is an important economic asset. Doing well by doing good. Investing in health. Greater equality, greater health, higher productivity. Um, healthier workers are more productive. More equality is associated with greater health. Um, high levels of inequality associated with higher levels of, of mental illness, even before COVID. Um, U.S., about 25, 27% of the population reports some mental illness. Um, Japan, with very little inequality, um, it's more like 8%. Germany, um, it's about the same. Uh, Italy has the lowest levels of mental illness because living in Italy is so good. Why is France so high? You know, well, even though France is a wonderful place, um, it's stressful. Educational scores are higher with more equal kinds. Um, higher inequality, less, worse scores. Look at Israel. What the hell's going on there? Lost lives and economic waste. Do we count the funerals? for as many as a quarter million extra dead Americans. Um, if we had the COVID mortality of the average for rich countries, we'd have about 500,000 fewer deaths. If we had the COVID mortality of the most successful um, affluent countries, countries like Canada, right over the border, we'd have 700,000 fewer deaths. That's a lot of economic waste. You know, I'm not counting all the long COVID cases, which I can vouch about, talk about. Um, life expectancy, longer and more equal countries. More inequality. U.S. is pretty extreme. Portugal is really bad. Um, Japan, on the other hand, is really extreme in the other direction. Uh, humane society is a more efficient one. Social solidarity lowers transactions costs and makes the division of labor work better. Solidarity in a society that treats you as a citizen. Treat people, one of the great lessons of economics is that people respond to how you treat them. You treat people like citizens, respectable people, people whose our individuality should be valued. You act that way. You value people. And they will respond by being more honest, more cooperative, and more productive. Stress people out. They become sick and inefficient and violent. Um, greater conflict leads to more social problems. Um, health and social problems are worse in more unequal U.S. states, um, except when you get to New York, which is a very healthy place, even though very high levels of inequality. Obviously, there's a lot else going on here. Connecticut also. Massachusetts, middling inequality, but we are such a great place. The Commonwealth of Massachusetts is superior to everybody except 
Well, it's a Vermont to Minnesota, New Hampshire, and North Dakota. Fuck that. Okay, economic growth depends on cooperation. These are the people who built the LEM, which I'm sure you, I hope you've seen the movie Apollo 13. It's a great movie. Um, my uh, father in law, not in this picture, but he was part of the team. They built the LEM, they worked together. I mean, you know, at one point in Apollo 13, um, one of the guys walks in and says, okay, here's everything they have. Now figure out how to make it work, uh, you know, for the air uh, purification. They had a team, they had a group there, 20 guys, whatever. And they figured it out, figured it out. Working together, no one is smart enough to figure it out. In fact, many, many studies of this give people, individuals, a reading and have them answer questions. Then have them discuss the question and the answers as a group. The group will always do better than any of the people individually. That's part of what capitalism, how capitalism is so good because capitalism taps into more people. But then if you let capitalism run amok, you get such inequality that most people check out or become destructive, uncooperative. Cooperation requires trust, commitment to others, and is undermined by the individualist incentives. But capitalism is really good at producing those individualist incentives. Red Sox work well sometimes. Um, even the best educated, most talented, benefit from equality that gives them educated people with whom to work. I mean, you may think, oh, I don't need anybody else. I'm so much smarter than everybody else. But you know what? You need people on your team. Um, that's what we celebrate on Thanksgiving. We celebrate cooperating. You know, so one time when the European settlers, yeah, were nice cooperating with the uh, um, Native Americans. Um, so Oakham's wrong. And Oakham's wrong in another basic way. If we just leave distribution to the market, who's going to pay for taking care of children? You know, if people are just going to look out for themselves, nobody's going to take care of the children. Nobody's going to take care of their neighbors. We're going to spread disease. Babies are all going to die. You know, everybody's going to get COVID. It's going to be awful. A society survives only because we limit the market and care for other people. Remember, things happen to people. Is it more efficient to let people die when something bad happens or to take care of them so that they can come back and be productive? Yeah, this kid's sick. So let her die or take care of her so that she'll grow up to be productive. Who's going to take care of these people in a society that's just organized to get people rich, individuals rich? Oh, there's Jet Puff and uh, um, Violet and some of her kittens. <laughs> okay, Oaken expects equality will reduce efficiency, but inequality reduces efficiency. Empirically, the inequality reduces efficiency is greater than the effect of equality. Now, to be sure, this is within the realm, the range of normal experience. You could imagine greater levels of equality than we usually see, and that may reduce efficiency. Um, but within the range that we experience, increases in inequality are associated with less efficiency. More equality would lead to more efficiency. Now, you may not care. You may say, oh, well, lower efficiency is the price we have to pay for rewarding people for their hard work. Um, 
we still should not take from the rich because the rich have earned it. Or maybe the rich are more worthy. However, you may have it. But the argument that taking from the rich to give to working people and the poor will lower efficiency is generally not true. And taking from poor people and working people to give to the rich does not raise efficiency and GDP. On the contrary, it makes things worse. Okay, that's it for today. Live long and prosper. Remember, um, as it said in Star Trek VIII, there's no money in the founding, in the Federation in the 24th century. We've moved well beyond that. So says Jean-Luc Picard. Yeah, there's no money. There's only Latinum. Okay, bye-bye.